Good day viewers. Welcome to a new edition of 30 Minutes, the interactive program of Trust Television. I'm Manir Dan Ali. And my guest today is Alaji Murtala Aliu, the Secretary General of the Arewa Consultative Forum, the ACF. He was a former Minister of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Welcome to the program, Alaji Murtala. Thank you very much. Why did you have to, I mean, the ACF, take the unusual step of almost reprimanding the president over this uh, issue of the currency swap that is over his non-obedience of the order of the Supreme Court? Well, it's actually not a reprimand. Um, it's just to draw attention of government to be responsive to uh, their own rules. The Supreme Court has um, passed a judgment on the, on the issue, and uh, over 10 days after, there's not been any response. Uh, and there are two or three ways to respond, either to see action on the ground, or at least to communicate, to talk to people and say, okay, this is what we are planning, we are restrained by ABCD, or constrained by ABCD, to, so we're putting this in order. Or that, look, we have a challenge. We cannot do uh, what the court asks us to do because of A, B, C, D. So we're going back to court. But there's but, no but, but is it possible? Is it possible to even disagree with the Supreme Court? Is the last court of the land. Can you decide to say you want to go back to, for the court to alter its judgment? Is that possible? No, no, I'm not a lawyer. But I think if there is something that's impossible, you can go back to court. Uh, for instance, if all the old currencies have been destroyed, and the new ones are not yet produced. They can ask for respite or whatever. But, 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 but we know the procedure of destroying this is a long process. There are processes that the CBN usually takes before such destruction happens. Could it have been the case? No, we don't know. I would have said that, look, the government must act. Um, the people are in bad shape. Uh, I went home uh, on these uh, election issues, and half of the town was uh, either outside hanging around banks to see if there will be some money or, uh, or angry sitting and sulking or, or generally discussing the issue of currency it has become the major issue you know of discussion and, um, and most of us that traveled found that kind of situation and you find that uh, even when they stay on the HMQ they get three thousand or five thousand after spending the whole day so I think that's not good secondly our markets the local markets are collapsing uh, so it's surprising that uh, the government has not been sensitive to that. This is but, but is it not more surprising that the government seems unaware or is unconcerned by all this, that with all its different arms, couldn't it be aware of this the state has meltdown? A, exa the state has, has uh, the structure and the instruments to know that. Um, and that's why we're surprised that nothing has been done. Is it that the message has not been getting to the appropriate quarters or that the, the appropriate quarters are being insensitive? And uh, I think it would be a bit worrying. Uh, and we thought we should talk. I've seen the state government, that is Dampara, Kaduna, and is it Kogi, who initially took the federal government to court, which led to the eventual judgment that the federal government and President Buhari and the CBN were all wrong to say that the old currency should stop being tender but should now continue until December. So these same state governments are talking up, wanting to go back to the Supreme Court so as to commit the federal government, President Obasanjo, the CBN, President uh, sorry, I mean President Muhammad Buhari, to contempt of court for not obeying a clear uh, judgment of the court. What do you think about that? I think the right of governors to, to go to court. But the, the issue is there are issues on the ground. And uh, we are concerned about the issues on the ground. I think the appropriate thing to do is the, for the governors to go back to court to take the uh, legal dimension. But before then, we want to believe that the government is going to be sensitive enough. Look, this is a government that has spent so much money on trying to wake up the small and medium scale uh, subsector of the economy. And um, this, this single policy is wiping off the small and medium scale sector. 
Um, markets in the villages are closing. I hear there are different prices for transactions on which are cash on transfer and, and then cash transfers. Yes. And, and that's, there are, number, I mean cash there are a number payment. of reasons for that. Yes. In the first place, when you transact in, uh, in, uh, through transfers, there are some villages in the north, especially because the land is wide. In Borno, in Yobe, in Sokoto, Zambara, Niger, Benue, that you may have to drive 100 kilometers before you get any bank. Now, if you have a small transaction, like 4,000 or 10,000 or so, and you have to go to the bank like that, or you can only transact through the uh, mobile equipment, and the, the person you're going to also has the same challenge. There's a big, there's a big problem. And the, in fact, even the microfinance banks that are supposed to serve those local areas, just, just last year, the CBN made, came up with a policy to recapitalize them, and most of them are winding up. Actually, there are about 900 microfinance banks. We are coming to about just slightly over 400. And most of those that, that wound up are from the northern part of the country. So it's a bit, um, it's a bit traumatizing when you see how people are really, uh, uh, people are in a mess. But at a time up in southern Nigeria, especially Lagos, mm. there was the rumor and the allegation that, look, this problem doesn't affect the north. The north is not affected by this uh, change of currency. That is why they are all happy. That's why you haven't heard of any rioting or public uh, display of anger. Well, you see, the, the, the problem is uh, most of the north is rural. And uh, so the, the transactions are low-key transactions. And it's mostly on food items and so on. And they have food stuck at home. So you find that the intensity of the, of the, of the problem uh, in, in terms of requirement, daily requirement, might not be as, as, uh, as much as that of the South, uh, where people go to offices, come back, you know, and collect their salaries and so on. Um, so it, I think it's, it's just perception. And again, unfortunately, most of our um, brothers and sisters in the South have no clear appreciation of the North on how the North is structured. Um, we, we react, but we don't just react to, to everything because we have structures that manage the space. And that is why we're not on the streets rioting and uh, throwing things and so on. But you see, in, in places where the transaction is a little bit more modern, you find that the reaction is more. They have burnt banks, they have destroyed certain property, and so on. So why we, we are talking for the country, but when we say especially the north, because um, uh, we, because of the lack of the facility even to, to service these transactions. There are no banks. But are you like sensing more frustration, which is why you are hinting at possible breakdown of law and order this kind of uh, situation continues. You see, the, the problem is that with the electronic tra transaction, sometimes you transfer. It indicates to you that it has not gone. You transfer again. Maybe there are multiple times you do that. Eventually, they all go. Uh, the person you, uh, you transact with is not where you know. He disappeared and so on. You've lost money. And, um, and you know the consequence of that. So our fear is that if that continues, the banks are not very efficient, their networks are not very good, and, uh, and uh, so it's a, weak, it's a weakness in the system. So that, that can cause some, dis when somebody is dispossessed of his uh, possession or his money or whatever, uh, he's, he's bound to react. So we are afraid. Then also the kind of crowd that uh, stay in the, uh, in the ATM machines is also, is also not looking safe. I was talking to a friend uh, who said he sent his son to the ATM machine after the morning prayer, which is around 6, uh, he sent yeah. him around 6, 6.30, and he was there till around 4. When he came back, he told the father he was uh, still number 99. So he had to just come and eat something and go back. Now this is the kind of situation we have, and all they wanted was 5,000 to buy food items for the day. So these are, these are real situations. They are not just concocted. And somehow the situation has also exposed the 
lack of robustness of the infrastructure, the electronic infrastructure of the banks, because some banks have more or less collapsed. Their infrastructure cannot cope with the volume of transactions Absolutely. that are going the, there. The banks are stampeded, and uh, even the large banks are having... Especially the large banks. Especially the large yes. banks, yes. Are having it difficult to, to manage the situation. Uh, because sometimes it takes two days to transact. You, you have a child in school who needs... Uh, you have a medical situation, you, you know, and, and sometimes the, the service providers, uh, I mean, service or goods providers are also not being sensitive. It's to protect their business. You go there, you, like hospitals, you, people die. You go there and they say they can only collect cash and there's no cash. Even when you have money in your bank, you know, it's difficult to, this development takes as fast. Elsewhere, you see that when policies like this of government cause so much pain, People take responsibility and either resign or get fired. Recall what happened in the UK when Kwasi, Kwateng and mm. the Prime Minister took an economic policy that sent the markets into a nose dive. They all had to go. Mm. But here we are, the CBN governor is pretty on his seat. Mm. And as you are saying, the president hasn't even said a word about maybe comforting people or the way forward in this very difficult situation. Well, our, own, our own thinking is that if the Syrian governor is there comfortable on his seat, it's because he's doing what uh, the government is happy with. Uh, because if they're not, they will call him to order. Um, the story about the independence of the Syrian, um, <laughs> it's not... You don't a, believe it? No, I mean, there's in, the, in, the, in, in, the practice. in the developing economy, well, there's no independence of the Sibian. After all, what happened to the previous Sibian governor? He was made to resign. So I think when things like this happen, probably the government itself is comfortable with the situation. But where they are is what is worrying. Which government will be happy when majority of citizens are in this kind of pain? When people can't buy simple drugs because they have no access to their money in the bank? When people cannot feed because they have no access to their money? when people cannot travel on social and other uh, reasons because they have no access to their money. Which government will be happy with that? Well, whatever the reason that government brought this policy now. I mean, there are two things. The currency change also, I mean, uh, uh, re redesign and um, cashlessness. There are two different separate policies. The two should have gone differently. When the mobile phone was introduced, uh, it seeped into the market. And um, today, almost everybody is uh, holding a mobile phone. So if a policy is good and it's comforting, people will embrace it. I was thinking that look, this cashlessness, I don't want to be carrying cash around. It has reduced crime. It has also reduced, uh, it has improved the security situation. But it's, it's, it's breeding another another dimension of the insecurity. Because now the people that will uh, you know, accost you in a, in a, maybe in a bus stop or so collect your wallet and so on, are no longer doing that because they know there's no money on you. So that's a positive side. Uh, the bandits are also slowing down on and uh, parking people. Now they ask for food stuff and so on. But they are still parking people, even as recent as a few days ago in both Niger, in Katsina. Yes. They parked the, lots of people. They have, but uh, the, the dimension is changing a bit from what it was before. Um, then ask for food stuff or for some negotiation to get uh, people released and so on. So there are positive side to this, and uh, when when money is banked, the corrupt politicians also or corrupt public servants or whatever will also now be more careful. But the issue is that there is a more fundamental issue on the ground, and that's the issue of the local person, the the innocent citizen uh, who should not be punished because that is caught up to, in all this up, that wants to achieve certain policies or certain objectives. Right. Mm. Okay, we'll continue with the conversation after this short break. Viewers, it is 30 minutes, the interactive program of Trust Television. And our guest today is Alaji Murtala Aliu, the General Secretary of the Arewa Consultative. Welcome back. It is still 30 minutes, the interactive program of Trust Television. And our guest today is the Secretary General of the Arewa Consultative Forum, ACF, Alhaji Murtala Aliu. Um, just before we came into this program, I saw a report that is quoting the governor of Anambra State 
that is uh, Charles Soludo, who himself was a former governor of the central bank, saying that the CBN is telling him that they are, they've ordered banks to begin accepting the old Nera notes. Is that the kind of thing you are expecting, or do you, are you expecting a more definitive thing, not through a third party, but directly either from the president or from the central bank itself on this matter, for it to clarify things and maybe begin to ease the very dire straits that people are now living because of the consequence of that uh, swap? Well, um, he's a... Um uh, Professor Solid is still a, is a, is a governor currently, and he's governor of Central Bank. But until there is um, a clear statement either from the CBN itself, uh, officially, or from the president, uh, we'll just consider it as hearsay. But our expectation is that the, pre the space should be freed for transaction to continue. Whether you're going to uh, release all notes, or you're going to bring in new notes, but they should be sufficient enough to... to to reactivate the, the, the transactions in the economy. The, the, the central bank said they mopped up over 2 point something trillion. 2.1 trillion. 2.1 trillion. trillion. And they are only printing about 300 billion. In a space where um, the actual central bank, they know, they know the money supply before. Even if some are hidden in some tanks and some circuitous, at least a central part of the 2.1 trillion or 3 point something trillion was in circulation. So I think the, they should measure up properly and then come up with a, a quantum or the quantity that will now be uh, fairly available to reactivate the market. Not just to, we don't want to hear from any third party saying that uh, uh, the, 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 the government is going to do A, B, C, D. Let them say it themselves. That is, you expect probably a speech from the president like the one he gave when he said you could still use the 200... Naira exactly. notes exactly. before he got overruled by the Supreme Court itself, and he doesn't appear to be keen to accept that. Yes, I mean we need we need something like that. Oh, the central bank governor can come and address and tell people their own plans. But you did hint at one crucial problem: that's the actual physical available money. Because if they haven't printed enough, what will they circulate? Well, like you said, there is a procedure in destroying all currencies. If all currencies are available, they should, for God's sake, push them out and, and let them circulate before they measure up. Even in developed countries where the cashless policy has taken root, they still have a lot of cash around. So, uh, I don't think uh, I don't think we should just be cashless overnight. We should we should try and do it systematically in such a way that it doesn't hurt the economy. Now that we have. a uh president-elect, does he have a role in this matter? I mean, because it is like in the Nigerian parlance, his own gari that could get spoiled by this continued uh, bottling up of the anger of the people by the outgoing government. In a civilized arrangement, by now, every policy that government will take, they should consult him. By now. Now, if they are not doing that, uh, it will be surprising, because they are, they are from the same party. Um, the president pushed also his campaign, and so on. So our expectation is that whatever it is that they are doing new, he will be consulted. Um, if he is, then he should be able to advise. Um, if he's not, then that would be unfortunate. And we still have the local election, that is the governorship, and state assembly elections, which INEC has shifted by a week, is coming later this week. Mm. What are your expectations of that, especially with this continued uh, fouled up atmosphere? Our worry is that there may be low turnout. Because it will be lower than what happened with the yes, presidential? Because, yes, because when I, I went uh, hoping that the election would have held last Saturday, most of the people I spoke to about uh, the election, and I was telling them, look, the turnout was low. I even um, le less optimistic that there's a need for them to come out and vote. And that would be a disaster. I mean, the, if a president uh, of an eight, uh, sorry, a 200 million population 
will, will, will win we'll by, get elected by, by, by 8 million yeah. votes. I mean, it's, uh, it shows certain disconnect between the people and the state. And I think that uh, government should worry about that. I, I hope the president-elect, when he comes in, will now try to address such, to wake up people's passion, you know, in favor of their country, in favor of the, the state, uh, the Nigerian state, and their commitment to the country. Because this sh clearly shows that people are not committed to the country. When the total number of uh, people that voted are just slightly over 30 million. Or could it be that because the system is much tighter and cleaner and there is less room for hanky-panky, for allocating numbers? Well, even if that's the case, what I'm saying is in real terms, assuming now this is the real population that came out to vote, and then we must instigate uh, the, the, the citizens to realize that, look, it's in their interest they come out and vote. Um, in a country where you have at least um, almost 90 million people uh, who are registered, who are registered over, 90 over 90 million people million. Are registered and you have just 30 percent i know all over all over turnouts are very low but that's because most elections are driven driven by passion we must wake up the people's uh, you know uh, the desire to love their country to to be to be aware of who comes to lead them and so on but is it because the governors, because these are about, these elections that are coming are about governors who are there closer to the people. Is it because the governors are so out of touch with the reality of people's lives that people don't care and people are even saying that maybe less number will even bother to come out and vote? It, ordinarily, ordinarily people should be more concerned about state governments, uh, state elections. Uh, unfortunately, because of the way we run our governance, um, it's a winner takes all. Uh, it becomes like local chiefs. And so but man, the moment somebody becomes the governor, people you know, just you know, cede the space to him, let him do as he wish. And then people are becoming disinterested in the matters uh, with the affairs of the state. And uh, that should be worrying, actually. The governors are the closer to the, the, closer to the people. They should be the ones to, to attract more attention. They should learn to really energize people to come out and, and vote, even for the national elections. Uh, but the rest is the case. Fortunately, anyway, I think the politics will change a bit because we have seen a lot of disruptions. Governors have realized that they can lose elections while they are in power. Indeed, that's the point I want to go to, mm. that in spite of what you said earlier, there are like places that are considered battleground, including the homestead of the president-elect, that is Lagos. Mm. You see the governor up and everywhere, mm. kissing babies, doing all the things that politicians mm. do when there are elections around the corner, especially after the result that they saw. Mm. Maybe that actually their party could lose even in Lagos. So, and then in your state of Gombe also, if the elections were held someday as the presidential, probably, the governor will be an outgoing governor, judging just by the results. And something in a number of other states, like including President Buhari's state of Kasina, the, of course, certainly Kano, mm. where by a massive margin, the NNP won the election. Is that uh, something to worry about or to cheer about? I, I think it's something to cheer about. It will mark, I think it will change the mindset of the governors if they are sensible, to know that, look, it's not going to be uh, uh, business as usual when they come in. Um, yes. be because the truth is that we really get the importance of, of the public relationship in governance. And uh, we just dish out lies and say we have done A, B, C, D, and so on. Now, people want to be, want to be integrated into the whole thing. People want to feel they belong. And one of the things that happened in, uh, in Kano uh, is because um, the NPP as a part, the NNPP as a party, maybe tried to identify with the people, you know, at least even if they are not in government, and so they drove that passion. And sometimes, you know, people vote against. Uh, it's possible the governors in uh, position are not doing exactly what is expected of them, and then people react by going the other way. Uh, but my own, my own hope is that the next batch of governors will now realize this and uh, become more sensitive 
to the economy of the people and their, and their immediate society. But some, of, some of these governors actually don't stay at home. They are mostly here with us in Abuja. And uh, one, two days they go and spend and come back. Are you still hopeful given the, I mean, what has been happening with governors who are preventing the, like, freedom, so to say, of the local councils, which they have been, like, overlords. Mm. Every legislature has tried to free them. And then because you need the concurrence of the state houses of assembly, that never happens. Even in this current cycle of amending the constitution, that seems to have failed. The governors haven't allowed the local governments to be really independent. You know, like the governors are lots in the, in the man, lots of one. It will change. Because How? now the tribe of ex governors is increasing. In each state, you have a huge tribe of ex governors, H6, ex that. And um, they may now become more rational. If you look at the way uh, Obasan Jory reacts to all governments after him, uh, he thinks he could have done uh, ordinarily, and he is, he is not doing, he's not expecting the governors coming after him to do. The 2003 election was not very good. The 2007 elections were awful. They were all conducted under Obasanjo. He is now the one, he's now the... The, the uh, messiah, messiah of election. Of election, yeah. uh, free elections. Yeah. Because now he can see things from a different prism. So the, the governors in the states now, there are more ex-governors now uh, uh, than, there are, than there have been, uh, you know, uh, senior citizens of uh, influential before. So these ex governors all had their own space, had their own influence, had their own, you know, you can see what happened in some states. Look at Cape State, for instance. Look at what's happening in Kano. So the ex governors will also come and want to play a role. So if they come together, they'll probably be able to influence certain things. I think as the democracy grows, I think we'll be able to be fine. On that note, we will wrap up and call it a day in this edition of 30 Minutes. Thank you very much for coming on the program. Thank you very much. Viewers, that is it. I'm Manir Dan Ali. Keep a date with us.